Okay, folks, good evening and welcome to Meet the Beekeeper from Hive World on April 20th. We're out here at the bee yard tonight. It's about 18 degrees. Uh, the bees have been flying really well today. Uh, the snow has just basically gone the last couple of days. And um, for those of you who weren't able to join us last week, um, we have another example of a classic formation of a dead hive. So I'm just opening up the hive here and you can see if I um, point out to you that there's a little cluster here of bees right on the top. little tiny cluster, not far from the front entrance, but very small. And on the top here, I'll bring the camera a little closer, but on the top here, you can actually see the marked queen from last year. She's just in the top here with a red dot. I'll see if I can bring that here for a close, closer look. So that's a real classic example of a situation where the queen died. Um, the, the cluster of bees along with the queen died early in the season. Um, it, the, the, the critical mass of the number of bees that were required to bring it through winter simply were not enough to uh, be able to handle some of the cold much um so if your hive looks like this it, it's it's relatively clean i mean there is it looks like there is some dysentery down in here but for the most part this would be a very classic example of a cluster that just simply got too small to be able to handle the colder weather um so if your hive is in this situation or you have a hive that's died and not, maybe, just, maybe doesn't look exactly like this, it's important to cover it over and close up all the entrances because any of these frames that do have honey left in them, it might be here, I mean, some of these have, do have honey left in them, already the bees from the area or your other local hives may be already finding this honey and trying to get in, and you can see these guys here. And I'm just going to take my... Um, camera down here so that you can see but you can also see we got some uh, bees around the corner here who have found a hive that had a hole and they've been quite successful in figuring out a way to get in and start to rob the hive out so these aren't necessarily my bees these could be a neighbor's bees within two or three miles so if you do have a hive that's died let me encourage you to block it up, block all the entrances up until you're ready to use those frames or shake a new package of bees in or put in a new nucleus. We'll take you over now to our overwintered hive that we showed you last week and we'll show you a little progress and we'll see how the brood nest is coming along. But before we do that, we'll just take some critical measurements. So as many of you would know that we're very um, passionate about uh, weighing and temperature inside the hive. And, um, we can just show you here on the camera, uh, hopefully, that the sensor I have inside this hive, uh, if we show the live data, we can see that the phone takes a second to connect to the Bluetooth device. And then we get a, a really good reading of 32 degrees with 67% humidity.
Now I'll show you when we go inside the hive where that sensor actually is. Um, so that you can understand when we've got that sensor sort of embedded into a frame. Um, in the center of the brood nest. Um, and this sensor is reading humidity and uh, the actual temperature of the brood nest. So it's reading 32 degrees. It's reading 32 degrees and we have 67% humidity. Now in addition to that, we can also Collect data from how high, how heavy the hive is. And you can see here that the weight of the hive um, has increased or decreases every hour to give you an idea of what the bees are doing with the stall. I don't know if you guys can hear my. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me any better. I do have made a couple of changes to the sound, so hopefully that improves it a little bit. Sorry about that, guys. I should be a little bit better now. I just made an adjustment to the. Uh, just made an adjustment to the uh, microphone setting. So just to recap then quickly on the sensors, um, the idea of the sensors is that we have some opportunities to understand what's going on inside the hive. And what we do know is, is that when the bees are maintaining a brood nest that's around 30 to 35 degrees, the queen is actively laying. And so long as the humidity remains around the 60%, 65% mark, we know that the bees are feeding the brood, which means that not only is the queen laying, but the bees are feeding the eggs that are hatching. So I hope that's, uh, I hope that's, um, hope that's of interest. Now also in addition to the hive scales, the scales also will help us to understand when the bees start to bring in more natural pollen than they are feeding pollen. And it's important to help beekeepers understand what's available naturally and if the bees are actually able to increase the weight of the hive with pollen and nectar in a 24 hour period. It's very important. Okay, we'll take a look inside the hive. I hope that the audio has improved. I have made a few changes here and it does sound like some people are getting a better connection. So just be free to continue to comment if the connection is not any improved. Okay, so it looked a little bit different to last week, but you can see that on the tie on the hive here we've got um, a hive top feeder, and it's a little bit of a newer design, uh, preferable for the fall, but we're giving it a whirl just to see how we like it. Um, basically, the, the syrup is around here. And the um, bees come up and they feed on the syrup and take it down on an entryway inside underneath. So it would require that you have an inner cover with a hole in the center um, so that you can actually 
allow the bees to come up through the center and feed um, and then go back down again. And, and one of the cool things about this design is that it avoids as much as possible uh, the bees drowning. So I'm going to take this off and then we'll lift up the inner cover and we begin to see some of the activity um, of the bees. One of the good things about those high top feeders or a large pail feeder over this middle hole here is, is this is directly over the top of the most of the hive activity. So the bees excess warmth now at this time of the year actually warms the syrup. Okay, so what you can see here, similar to last week, is we've got um, the pollen paddies. Now they look green, they don't look orange, and I can explain that in a moment. We've got one here that's almost gone. We've got some really good activity of the bees here in the center. And one of the nice things about this is they're very quiet, and that's, that's uh, a good indicator that the bees are doing a great job in bringing as much of the syrup down as possible to support the queen's laying activities. So they're quiet, they're on the comb, and I was in here yesterday just to make sure everything was okay, and we, uh, we were able to see the queen, which we'll try and do again today. And um, we also saw some very reasonable patches of brood. That she's into a couple of brood cycles already for the springtime, and um, as you also know, we, as we mentioned last week, we have the uh, strips here for some level of mite control, which we'll take out and discard next. So this is the first frame that I'll show you, and this is the frame that's got the number on it to tell me that this is the frame that has the sensor in it. And um, you can see there, when I move the bees away, or blowing them very gently, that a, sort of a, a plastic gauze thing begins to be exposed. And that's uh, inside there is the sensor, and the bees have blocked that up with tremendous amounts of wax and propolis. Keeps it nice and still, and it also means that it doesn't change, the temperature doesn't fluctuate as much as it would do if it wasn't all blocked up. So, as the hive warms up and the temperature increases, um, the sensor connects to your phone with Bluetooth, and it can give you a very quick indicator from your house, or, your, or nearby, that your queen is laying and the, and the brood nest is in good condition. Thank you. 
Okay, so here we can see quite a distinct section of cat brood at the bottom of the frame. Uh, quite a large section that bees are moving away from. Um, gives us a really great indication that the queen is laying and she's laying well. This is a really good population for the size, uh, for the amount of bees coverage. Um, so it gives me a good feeling about the quality of the queen and the fact that she's made it through such a difficult winter. I'm just looking for her here to see if we can see her on any of the frames. So there's the queen, and she's in a very classic position. So she's walking over the cat brood that is currently hatching. You can see if you can spot her there, moving over the comb. If you can't already see her, she's just right here. A very large, dark Russian queen. This is one of our breeder queens that we use here at Hive World. So we graft a lot of the queens from her that we supply her in the nucleuses. She's a very large brood nest. She's got eggs out, a very large radius outside here that will be ready to hatch and go into cat brood in the days to come. Okay, so if you are if you are looking at your beehive or going into your beehive in the spring, make sure you put the frames back in the same order that you took them out. Make sure that make sure that uh, make sure that pollen paddies are connected and close to the cluster and then be also certain that if you're going to use any sort of mite treatment that you've tested prior to treating and in order to test how you test whether you need to treat you can join us next week at Meet the Beekeeper and we're going to do a demonstration of how you actually test for Varroa. Once you've tested for Varroa and you've got a count of the number of Varroa mites, you can then make a determined choice about whether it's necessary to treat for them. And we do encourage you to test before you treat for Varroa mites. Now just the story behind these green pollen paddies. So it is a pollen substitute, but it's a new product that we're trialling here this year at High World, and it's um, a seaweed based product. And it's designed to feed the bees some other essential ingredients that may prove to help them be more resilient especially in alberta where when the bees are able to feed on something natural um it's a it's a singular typically a singular crop which is uh, to do with monocropping so the bees are, dis are, de are developing and showing signs of problems with monocropping uh which is starting to produce some ideas from scientists that some other supplements might be a good idea so we're experimenting with this product this year and uh, if we're happy and our beekeepers um deem that it's uh, a good product we'll make it 
more readily available to uh, our store line in 2021. One important thing is that once you have started to feed in the spring, we do encourage you to maintain that nectar flow, the, 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 the sort of a false nectar flow, and make sure that that syrup remains on there for as long as is necessary until the bees have natural flow. Now, again, people say often say, well, how do you know if they're having natural flow or not? And again, I would encourage any hobbyist beekeeper with some serious concern for bees is to look at getting one of the hive scales that can be Bluetooth to your phone. And it can show you daily gain and daily loss. And if your bees are consistently losing weight every day, it means that the resources in the hive are being put into brood. And of course, the resulting brood is much less than the pollen and the nectar used to create them. So if your bees are losing weight every day in the spring, it's going to be important to make sure that you add that two or three or four litres of syrup every four or five days on top of the hive until the natural nectar and pollen comes in. Now, once natural nectar and pollen begins to come in, it's important to understand that they, they come to an end. So the willows may start. In BC, we've had the willows already. Uh, we're now coming into the blueberries and the maples. In Alberta, we really haven't had anything yet. And maybe by, maybe by this weekend, we're anticipating in the north here to start to see some willow flow. But the willows end. And then comes dandelions. And then the dandelions end. And it's important to understand what your bees are dealing with when those flows come to an end. Because if your hive is gaining every day, you can be confident the queen is laying and there's general production in the hive. But if the dandelions finish and the bees have got no extra resources and they're already at a very, very large hive with very little resources, um, they'll need feeding before the honey flow begins in July. So I hope you find this useful. I'm just going to reassemble this lid uh, back on top here, the, the feeder back on top here, add some syrup, and then I will turn my attention to the chat and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so send any questions in and we'll try and do our best to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so Rowan asks, when will the mouse garden reducer be removed? So it's a great question. 
So one of the things that we'll be experiencing at this time of the year is a general dwindling of the population before the new bees start to take over in numbers. So we do encourage you to keep on the mouse guard and the entrance reducer until the May long weekend when you take off your uh, your black uh, paper, um, the black paper or the uh, if you have an insulated wrap. So. May long weekend or prior, if it gets very, very, very warm, you can remove the mouse guard and then you can remove the entrance reducer uh, at the time when the dandelions are about a two weeks or ten days into them. Uh, John Hovey asks, you guys sell those feeders. So, again, it's a new feeder we're testing. Um, we like them. We like the way they operate. We want to make sure that the rate that the bees can take down the food is fast enough for our liking and we do like what we see so far um so john yes we will have those feeders in for the next beekeeping season not for this season okay we'll just we'll remain on for a couple more minutes and uh any other questions pop them in the chat and we'll be um, glad to provide you a little uh, answer the best we can. You can also watch out on your emails um, for a promotion that we do have coming up next month in May for the Hive Scales and for the Broodminder Sensor. For those of you in the Edmonton area, we do expect to have some decent weather over the next 14 days. So we are expecting at any time now for the willow flow to officially start. And the willow flow is easy to recognize because the bees will be bringing in um, pretty significant amounts of pollen. So you can be confident that it's coming from willow at this time of year. Um, and then uh, with the season being a little later this year, it's very likely that the willow will follow on directly onto the dandelion flow in Alberta. If you're in BC, um, many of you may know that the uh, the maple trees are just beginning now, which is quite unusual. It's usually it's a little later than normal. Um, and it's gonna the, the maple flow is gonna occur right at the same time as the uh, black uh, the blueberries begin to open. So it's really uh, it's really complicated pollination plans. For the commercial operators this year because there's going to have to be more bees put into the blueberries to make sure that we have a new um that we have a new uh that they have enough bees going into the blueberries because so much of the bees attention will be to the maples because the very the bees are very easily attracted to the maple trees um Jeremy asks, is it okay to move hives a short distance? Yes, uh, Jeremy, it is. Um, so if it's 200 yards, so anything within anything within a mile is a bit of a challenge. So if it's 200 yards, then you, what you want to do is do about 10 feet every day. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but if you do it 10 feet every decent flying day, the bees will reorientate to the hive. If you get a really gray day, um, you might get away with a little bit further. Um but yeah, if you want to move it that far, uh, just be patient and do it over, you know, move it six to ten feet each day. Uh, William asks that he's new and he's ordered a hive. Um, how do I know if my area has enough pollen or flowers? So it's a great question. So... Uh, depending on exactly where you are, any usually anywhere in the lower mainland is one of the best areas for bees, uh, especially if you're in, within a flying distance of blackberries, which is your typical main honey flow in June. Uh, if you're in Alberta, it's very, very, very hard to have a hive and it not be able to make surplus honey the first year just for the simple fact of um, what grows on the prairie and how it grows. Okay, guys, well, that's good for April 20th. Any other questions or concerns or ideas for next time, anytime, email us, info at hiveworld.ca. 
Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night.